Welcome to the Unconventional Dyad Podcast, where psychology and psychoanalysis meet social justice, feminism, politics, climate change, critical theory, graduate student mental health, and the arts. Your hosts are Carly and Laura, two graduate students and friends committed to bridging the gap between the field of psychology, social issues, and society. Thank you for joining us. everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Unconventional Dyad podcast. Today we have Dr. Lara Shihai with us who is an assistant professor in clinical psychology at George Washington University. She works on decolonial struggles as well as power, race, class and gender constructs and dynamics within psychoanalysis. She does this by practicing through a trans-inclusive or feminist and liberation theory model. Today on the podcast, we discuss our relationship to structures and knowing our position within those structures. More specifically, we discuss curriculum development and the burden often placed on marginalized students being asked to hold the affect in the room and educate others. We also engage in a discussion about my own seduction into geographical differences of the accessibility of specific ideas, thought, and theory. We explored how this seduction displaces attention from the very real structural issues that are in place across the United States, not just within the Midwest. We also briefly discussed the danger of using ego psychology as a structure against which we compare everything else. For example, clinicians often forget that our history is in fact how we still practice today, and our responsibility is to be accountable for all of psychoanalysis, especially in the present day. We are not in a position as professionals, as psychologists, psychoanalysts, or even students to critique where we once were when in fact we are still there today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Laura, thank you so much for joining us on the Unconventional Dia podcast. I'm really excited to get a chance to talk with you today. It's so good to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I was, I know I was singing your praises before we came online and I need to do that publicly because you, you're both amazing. Oh, that's, it's great to hear. It's, it's really nice to have amazing guests on and I'm really looking forward to where the podcast is heading next. Before we get started, can you share a little bit about yourself, maybe share parts of your personal and uh, professional identities that you think are important for our listeners to know about? Sure. Um, so let me start first by, I, I start off like this all the time. I think it's, you know, in some ways, uh, folks have been doing this way longer than psychologists definitely have, and way longer than psychoanalysis definitely has. Um, but just sort of pay respect to the land I'm coming from. Um, in the Zoom world, I think we're much more likely to be disembodied sort of floating heads and folks might forget that they're still an embodied being in their space. And I'm currently what is now known as Williamsburg, Virginia, which is Pamunkey land, it's traditional Pamunkey land. And I offer that up as a sort of respect to um, the folks who were here and were genocided by settlers and continue to be disenfranchised and continue to genocide. And I, I think that is a central part of my being when whenever I locate myself, there's a location of of um, in many ways, the reality principle. I think there's, we can use psychoanalysis to help us understand why folks might forget that. Even I've been in places where like we've said loud and clear, please do a land acknowledgement and people still forget it. There's something that's happening when people forget. And I think that that's built into the fabric of the United States in general. Um, and it's and it's racial history and it's genocidal history. And so <clears throat> naming that constantly is not, performative for me. It's a ethical commitment to um, not disavowing reality, to recognize that there is, this was Turtle Island and continues to be, right? Past, present, future. Unconscious works like that. So time works like that. So when I say it used to be, I'm not just saying it was of the past. I'm saying overlaid on top of that reality is the reality of what we have in the Unis- United States right now. So um, this is Pamunkey land. Uh, there was a treaty, but I'm, I'm, you know, come on. <laughs> Treaties are coercive. So I will treat it as though um, 
you know, as it is that it's occupied land. Um, I am an Arab Lebanese uh, clinician. I'm psychoanalytically oriented. Um, <clears throat> I teach at GW PsyD program. I'm an assistant professor of clinical psychology there. Um, I'm cis, I'm queer, I'm um, happily partnered with my husband. Um, and I consider myself um, an activist in all sense of the word. I'm my my sense is that one can't do clinical work without being an activist. I know many people disagree with that, but that is the position that I take. Um, and I think that covers it all. You also went to school where you're currently teaching. Yes. Am I, okay. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that process for you? What, what brought you back? Okay. Yeah. That institution. That's a great question. Um, so I came to GW straight from Lebanon. I was doing my undergrad at the American University of Beirut, and I was an English literature major. Um, and those of us who do psychodynamic or psychoanalytic work know that psychoanalysis is dead in psychology and alive in the literatures <laughs> and in comparative literature and everything else and critical race theory. You know, every theory seems to go want to sort of look to psychoanalysis and what it might have to offer in terms of liberatory potential, except for psychology, which is not by chance, right? From the shift of what we see in the context of the United States of psychology and the sort of over obsession with science and, and science as though that is not also constructed and the coding, what, what the code of science actually means. Um, <clears throat> so I was looking for psychodynamic programs and you know, as things happen, it was, I was super lucky. I was um, given a scholarship to attend a women in global leadership uh, conference in Dubai of all places, the Dubai before the Dubai we know today, it was still um, being built up. And that's a whole other <laughs> conversation. Um, and I happened to be when we were getting taken to the place where we were having the conference, I was sitting next to a psychologist who happened to be a psychoanalyst who lived in Richmond, Virginia. And he just struck a conversation with me. And I said, I'm looking at graduate school. I have no idea where to start. I'm, you know, I was in Lebanon. It's very hard to sort of access what does it mean to have to do graduate school in the United States and what programs are what. And he said, let me send you a list of all the psychodynamic programs in the country. So um, that's what started it off. GW was the top of my list. Uh, at the time, it was headed by Dorothy Holmes, who's um, a wonderful person and sort of, um, you know, created a path for um, issues related to race, particularly issues of um, looking at blackness in the context of psychoanalysis and in the United States. And she was the director there. So I remember um, coming in and interviewing and she was speaking and I was like, I want to be this person. <laughs> this is the per I mean, just how absolutely on point she was about everything and how um, she was able to sort of harness this theory in a way and speak to complicated issues and make it look easy. Right. Um, and I said, this is precisely what I'm looking for. The reality of the transition wasn't as sexy <laughs> as that. Anybody who knows what it's like to be in graduate school in institutions in general, um, there's a huge pressure to conform and to sort of stick within a very rigid understanding of what curriculum looks like, of what, you know, prof professionalization looks like, about what a, a, a good clinical psychologist trainee looks like, which, of course, includes um, in many times not being engaged in activism, um, not speaking about racial issues. I was coming as an Arab woman post 9-11, very pro-Palestinian as well, into a space that I had no idea what the racial codes were. I was coming straight from Lebanon into the United States. I'd lived in Canada, in very rural Canada when I was younger for seven years. And I came in and had to learn very quickly what it meant to be an Arab, um, not white and not black in the context of the United States. Um, while in Lebanon, I was part of activist struggles, of pro-Palestinian struggles I've always been a part of. And while we, while I was at um, American University of Beirut, Kathleen Cleaver of the Black Panther Party had come. So I, I was involved in sort of what it meant to have a global racial solidarity um, struggle already before I came. And then I came to the United States and I was like, oh, holy shit, this actually applies also. The way these things 
um, shake out, shake out in the context of clinical work. I was still naive. I was 21 years old when I went to graduate school. I was very naive and I thought psychoanalysis with its depth and psychology would allow people to think more critically, would allow people to sort of abstain from the sort of splitting that people do or the activation, the overactivation of emotions when you talk about these issues. And I was very wrong about that. Um, my cohort um, was 35 people at that time. We've gotten a lot smaller since then, but I was one of maybe three people of color. I had one black uh, classmate who's one of my best friends still to this day. Um, <clears throat> I think actually we were five uh, folks of color, two of whom didn't identify as people of color. I would identify as that, but they didn't. So that's what I mean about also learning what that meant. What does that mean that in the context of the United States, I can read someone as a minority or a person of color, but they themselves might not attribute that to themselves. And I learned very quickly that racial codes overlap also with immigration status and with class issues and what it meant to be a model minority and the very complicated history of Arabs in the United States and anti-Blackness within the Arab community. And just all of that was like drinking from a hose <laughs> for getting here. And, um, you know, I found my solace in an unbending orientation towards social justice and what that meant and what that meant in terms of my relationship to structures and how that might change from my relationship to structures in Lebanon necessarily was different when I came here. And it was really, uh, you know, a learning curve about like, okay, what does that mean now? I, I might know my position, but what does that mean to come from a history of Arabs in the United States that didn't hold that position? What responsibility do I have as a part of that community to intervene and speak up and use my voice to do that? Not surprisingly, I didn't write about Arabs or think about Arabs as much then. I, and I think now I understand that it was too dangerous for me to go into those places. I still was working through my own stuff. Um, I, I came in, I pronounced my name, not the Arab way, as though, you know, I didn't know how to pronounce my name. I immediately shifted. Um, but there was, again, that sort of solid line. Having Dorothy Holmes at the helm, talking about issues of Blackness within psychoanalysis, fed my soul. I realized there was something else, but it wasn't necessarily being reflected in the ways that I wanted to. Along the way, we would have speakers come in and I met people in the field like Lynn Layton, um, who talks about social psychoanalysis and who had, you know, came in with a breath of fresh air. And I was like, okay, there is a space within psychoanalysis because at some point I started to lose hope, right? You, you're in there and you're sort of, okay, I'm doing my stuff and there's only so much that you can like delay when am I going to get to this place? And a lot of times you hear, maybe as students, you hear people say, okay, learn this now. And then later when you graduate, you can do what you want. Or, but that's not sustain, doesn't feel sustainable, particularly as a person of color. And um, having that material be an actual attack on your being. And I could say that that's for many marginalized communities. When you read material that fundamentally disagrees with your selfhood, that fundamentally uh, is oppressive, that's fundamentally um, retrograde in terms of how it reads people's experiences, there's only so much it can sustain you to say, oh, but later on. And so, um, you know, I found ways around it. I was involved and very active in, in marching and, and I co-founded the um, campus anti-war network that helped sustain me. But psychoanalysis kind of wasn't really doing it for me in that way until I met people like Lynn Layton and um, Kimberlyn Leary and folks who were talking about this. So I started reading that a lot more. I don't know if I could have come back to the program had I not taken time away. And I think that was very important, both personally and professionally. One, because your graduate home has so much meaning to it and so much growth, which always includes also a certain degree of trauma that's involved in it, um, especially if you're an international student, especially if you're a person from a marginalized community. Um, I needed time away to think through what was me, what was the cohort, what was the dynamics, what was racialized, what was not. It took me four years after graduating to write my first piece where I really did process what happened 
in my graduate experience. It is not by any means specific to GW. It was what I now understand as a larger structural reenactment of racial hierarchy, of folks reading me a certain way, of folks, um, I had one person in my class who cornered me and was like, why are you disavowing your whiteness? As though like my, I'm a light-skinned Arab and obviously I admit that and that affords me a lot of privileges in terms of how people read me and how I navigate the world. But I was not white. There's not one part of me that's white. (laughs) And so things like that, I think people read me as a race traitor and reacted to me in very specific ways around that. And I still didn't have the language, right? Like now we see mainstreaming of language like white privilege and white supremacy. And that's fantastic. I talk to my students all the time about that. At the time when I was in graduate school, my best friend Um, who's Nigerian American, who continues to be my best friend, printed out a paper about white privilege and put it in the boxes of our classmates. And they erupted with rage. I mean, this was not even thought this idea of like, you know, whiteness, and it wasn't as present as it is right now. Now, what's interesting is that just because it's present doesn't make it easier to talk about. You guys can probably tell me, I'm sorry for my gendered language, you all could probably tell me um, that you, you know, you can still bring up racial stuff and it melts down in a second, right? So just because we have the language doesn't mean that it's gotten better, but there is a stark difference between what it was. And so to loop back around a very long story of your question of how did you find yourself back there, right? I always knew I wanted to teach. This is something that is sort of deeply um, embedded within me. I loved connecting to folks in that way. Um, and I wanted to be a connection to students in a way that in, in many ways I had in some of my faculty, but in other ways I didn't. And it was really important for me to come back and say, okay, how do I show up in these spaces in ways that continue what I started in graduate school? I didn't care very much about, you know, at the time about GW as an institution, but I loved my program and what it provided me. When I went on internship, I realized, wow, I had phenomenal training and I still maintain that. I think our students recognize that too. And I also maintain that nobody from the outside should be more critical about the spaces we hold than we are. So I am committed to being those spaces and taking a sort of inward lens and saying what is happening structurally here um, where again, not specific to GW, every cohort, if we see this happening in every cohort, right? There's a, there's a message to us. There's something larger happening. And I was really invested in, in coming back and being a part of looking earnestly at that, what Dorothy Holmes had started and what had continued under our current director, Lauren Ingram. Um, and I think that was part of my hiring as well. And so I, I came in and I sort of was, was responsible was responsible also for co-creating a diversity curriculum, um, which I envisioned was the sort of three-tier model that was not just your regular, well, let's check off the boxes and this is diversity and let's list off the things and say that's intersectionality. Um, it was much more a structural approach, which was three-tiered. And I, and I envisioned it as a developmental apprenticeship model with the idea being that like, from my own experience, not everybody comes in with the same comfort level or lived experience of these things. And yet when you sit in a classroom as a student, you're expected to take up these issues as though, you, as though you're at the same level. And th- that is a setup across the board, especially for marginalized students, because they're always the ones who are tasked with holding the affect in the room. They're always the ones who are tasked with being the ones who teach people about their experience And they've already lived this in a way that's so real and so dangerous and so threatening. And now they're in an an educational environment where they're expected to be professional and teach their cohort members about what it's like to work with other people. Not only is that homogenizing in a way that's really dangerous, but it misses the point that psychoanalysis teaches us about group dynamics and about what happens and how we do regress to structural issues that are um, that are fundamentally oppressive. Um, and that's sort of what I, you know, if I had a vision about why I wanted to come back, I don't know that it was that detailed at the time, but I think I've grown into that. And my program director and my colleagues have 
joined, you know, have allowed me that space to grow into that and to struggle with me. We're struggling, right? Like every institution should be struggling right now. And it, it's not a negative struggle. It's, it's a generative one and it's one that's painful, but it's, it's one that I, I'm looking back now as a graduate student, if I could look into the future and say, this is where this would be, I, I think it would have given me a lot of hope that I didn't have at the time. <laughs> You mentioned this idea that minoritized populations hold the burden of educating and teaching not only others in the classroom, but maybe the professors. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to why that happens and maybe ways that we can get beyond that to not allow that to happen with yeah. institutions. I mean, I think fundamentally it happens because that's how our society is structured, right? On the It's double-sided. And if we look at psychoanalysis as sort of teaching us about how structures are produced and reproduced. And if we think about the unconscious as structuring everything, why wouldn't we believe that the unconscious reproduces itself in the classroom? I think where we go wrong is we forget our theory in these very important spaces, right? It's like somehow theory exists only in our minds and only in the clinic and sometimes not even there, but in the somehow in the curriculum that we don't think that this shows up in our training or in our spaces or that it way predates when our students walk into the room, just how students are socialized, um, or if you have folks who were not socialized in the United States, and then you have them be a part of a cohort, cohort, and then they also sort of, this is what I mean about my learning curve of coming in, I'm like, I'm learning the codes very quickly because they're not the same codes, right? There's a particular specificity to the history of the United States that is really important around racial issues and around class issues. Um, and it's very specific to this. So number one, the fact that those, all those are very rarely talked about is precisely why it happens. When you disavow reality and you don't name it up front, this is like a fundamental tenet of psychoanalysis. It will come back to bite you and it'll come up in different ways symptomatically. The way it breaks down, in my mind, is around fault lines that already exist ideologically. That's why we see it fall on gender lines, on class lines, on issues of ability, on who ends up holding a narrative that's thought about as normative and who falls outside of that and becomes um, sort of marginalized. They are not marginal in, in and of their essence. They become marginalized through the process and through the structure. If those fault lines already exist, it's only conceivable, they're going to replicate themselves in our rooms. And again, we don't have to reach far for that. We, our theory tells us this. As long as we don't understand that as a purview of curriculum and training, we will always be surprised when it happens in the room. And I see a lot of times what ends up happening is an overall avoidance of it rather than a naming of it up front. An expectation like I tell my students all the time, these are non-negotiable starting points. These are non-negotiable truths. We are not here to debate whether or not structural racism exists or patriarchy exists or capitalist enterprise and exploitation exists. These are non-negotiable starting points. And everybody's psychic structure is fundamentally replicated through that. And when we show up in a group process, of course, it's going to recreate here. And I think in many ways that diffuses so much, it doesn't take care of it, of course. That's the other piece of it. What are we doing about actual skills around facilitation of these things? Are we committing ourselves to actually a ethics of constantly questioning um, these structures and how they replicate themselves? What Lynn Leighton and Mariana uh, Levi Speronis might call a disillusionment, an ethics of disillusionment. We are, we should be constantly saying, these will happen. This is a given. And are we learning skills of intervention rather than of leaning into avoidance, which is always in sh is shoring up what psychology would say, it shores up and is in service of white supremacy. There's no way around it. And white supremacy is not just about you know, race, obviously, it's about um, issues of ability and disability, it's about gender, it's about um, sexuality, it's, it's all those fault lines that push a certain given of normativity. And, and 
decenters everything else, right? I name that up front in my classroom and I'm a part of that conversation. The other thing is that I think why it ends up happening is because there's a deeply skewed power imbalance that oftentimes is not spoken to. If I'm a professor in the room and I'm asking you to take up these issues, I have to take up these issues with you. I'm not existing outside of this. This is what happens in the clinical space when psychologists or psychoanalysts or whatever thinks that they are outside the process. A lot of people will say, no, I don't think my theory, whether it's relational theory or intersubjective theory or any of the sort of more contemporary theories will say, no, I am actually part of this process. But when you look at it and when you push a little further, people oftentimes because of white supremacy and because of how these structures replicate themselves have a very convenient out, right? And that is that happens sometimes unconsciously and sometimes consciously. If it continues to happen over and over again, and you have an entire movement and a global scholarship telling you this is what's happening and you still don't take it up, that's no longer unconscious. That is not an enactment. That is just, you know, and I think this is the other thing is that we get caught up in explaining these things in our theory and rarely say, okay, in reality space, what is happening here? If we just continue to call things enactments and not look at what is happening consciously, because enactments imp imply that there's an unconscious element to it. And enactments are not conscious, right? They become conscious. And that's what clinically and technically we think people can move away from enactments when they're named and they become conscious, right? As long as they're unconscious, they're, if we continue to call things racial enactments or all the, or, or any one of the, the things that we say, we're constantly implying there's an unconscious process to it. I think we're beyond that. Right. Mm -hmm. I think we're at the space now where we can say, no, there's some conscious element to this. There's some unconscious mechanics. Right. But there are conscious elements to this. And that's what we call structural racism. And that's what we call these things that replicate themselves consistently. And if you're unwilling to take them up seriously, that is not unconscious anymore. That is the parallel of a patient coming in. And you, you're saying making the same intervention over and over again. And, and I'm using this as an example because I don't actually believe in that type of like, I'm telling the patients, I'm like, I'm the all knower or something. But this sort of mm -hmm. very traditional example of I'm coming in and I'm telling the patient thing over and over and over again, they continue not to take me up on this. Like, how is that any different than people saying no structural racism does exist? Patriarchy exists, capitalist exploitation exists, and we are implicated in all of that. Right? We are deeply implicated in all of that. Um, if that continues to be disavowed, it will always show up in our classrooms. And I think this is why that happens. The difficult part of that, so that's a sort of like analytic reading of that happens and an oversimplified one too. But the difficulty and the real danger and the harm of that, right? is that folks with marginalized identity end up, and from a psychological perspective or psychoanalytic perspective, um, there's a double sort of threat that's involved. On the one hand, they're always asked and tasked to be the, the knowledge producers, right? Like teach me everything. And then it becomes extractive because on the flip side, there's also, a deep retribution that comes for folks speaking up and naming issues. So it's not even a fair, you know, the second you engage in this, you are already on the losing end of it because when structures are made to maintain themselves, power is made to continue to be powerful. So it extracts, it, it expands and contracts in ways that keeps it going, right? Keeps it viable. So you can co-opt somebody but they'll never become part of that structure because the point is to, right, is to create continued debility or disenfranchisement. That is, it's built like that. It's constitutively like that. And so I think there's, on the one hand, you're tasking people to tell you what's going on. On the other hand, there's a reality of retribution and crushing dissent and defensiveness that comes with white supremacy that wants to maintain its, you know, viability. Um, and what Fanon would tell us is that the oppressed are always considered guilty. You're already presumed guilty before you. So there's always an a invitation 
for us to engage within systems, but the presumption is already there. So it's not, it's like presented as a fair game, <laughs> but it's not, you're already completely compromised by virtue of engaging in that. And a, you know, I don't think there's any way around it rather than sort of naming that reality and using, hopefully using our psychoanalytic tools to say, here's why that's a reality. And, and how do we engage differently? How do we engage differently on a training level? How do we engage differently on a systemic level? Who is having these conversations? Who's allowed to have these conversations? Whose voices are sort of uh, present? Who's never thought of, right? There's still um, swaths of population and folks that are not represented at all, you know, and are never thought of on, on purpose, I think. I'm wondering from a education perspective, we are in the Midwest and I am, I imagine I, I have never been in training on the East coast, but it seems very different to me. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about what might be causing that difference and really what we can do here in the Midwest to maybe integrate some more of these threes within our educational systems, within our yeah. curricula. Yeah. What, what do you have to say uh, I about love that? that question. And as much as it opens up a, uh, again, the issue of specificity. I have to say, I'm always weary of a geographical, uh, the seduction into geographical difference at its heart, like as an essential thing, right? Because I think what that does is uh, displace our attention to the real structural issues that would create the conditions where you all feel like the Midwest doesn't have access to certain ideas, whereas the East Coast does, right? Which which are many. They're racialized. They're class issues. They're I, I just like I resist the sort of generational uh, analysis where older people in psychoanalysis are like long gone and they don't know anything. And it's the younger people that are really breathing life into this. And in some ways, there's a there is a reality to that. I don't want to discount that. But I don't know that the mechanics of that are as simple as it looks, because I have met a lot of older folks that are far mm -hmm. more committed and less conservative than younger folks and vice versa, right? So I think the question is a question of who holds power, who determines what shows up, what are the larger structures, even in the field, right? That the field would have you believe that the pockets of brilliance are on the East Coast, right? Um, that might be it for many different <laughs> reasons, not the least of which is, uh, you know, population density and all of that, but, but also what are, what are the larger structural issues that would have people move towards these cities and become gentrifiers, by the way, um, and then set themselves up as though it's an organic natural process that New York has a lot of vitality in terms of psychoanalysis, right? Um, so I don't know that I'm, I'm specifically answering that. What I would say is, again, I always resist the sort of, um, the seduction into ge geographical space or individualized reasons for things rather than looking at a larger field issue, right? Um, where, why are, for example, where, why aren't there more community building practices from East Coast to the Midwest? If people are talking about the psych psychoanalysis dying, why don't people know that your program exists? Why aren't folks making inroads into spaces that they don't imagine psychoanalysis exists. Well, in our mind, we should, that is part of the problem. That is part of the purity aspect of psychoanalysis that shores up a supremacist idea because by doing that, and the Midwest is just an example, right? But by doing that, we're effectively saying there are places where psychoanalysis exists and there are places where psychoanalysis doesn't exist. And that gets very dangerous about like, what are the spaces that are that feed psychoanalysis and become a perfect space for that? And what are places where psychoanalysis just can't grow and is, is not at, at all accessible, right? We see these parallels, by the way, in class issues. For ages, people have said that folks who come from poverty are not, you know, uh, set up to do psychoanalysis in some way for a, a, um, a, a deeply classist and elitist belief of them not having in the interiority to do that, or they're just so busy with surviving that they don't have time to be introspective. <laughs> it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, of course, but it brings up the same questions for me. 
that there is a larger Mm -hmm. hegemonic structure that is naming where psychoanalysis can live and where it can't. And where um, progressive ideas about where the field should go or needs to go, right? As an ethical imperative, not just like as a necessity, not just how I hear it talked about, oh, we need to survive. Like that's, that's creepy. When people start talking about psychoanalysis is gonna die, we need to survive. Let's get more young people and brown people. That gets like, that's super eugenicist and very creepy. That's why I take a step mm-hmm. back and I go, what, what is the, what are the optics of this? And how did we create the conditions that that could be? You bring up such a good point and I would like to maybe reframe my question and, and maybe this will lead to maybe even a, a deeper conversation. Something I've been thinking about a lot is the access that we have to ideas like Fanon or Hegel, whoever it might be, Lacan, for example. Why in the Midwest, if you go to a philosophy department, you can read all you want about any of these thinkers, but it just doesn't exist in the institutions here. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about why that might be, uh, how we can change it if it needs yeah, to be changed. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And I think it's, it ties into what we were just talking about, right? It's larger, I mean, there's a, there's a larger higher education question here in the context of the United States about what is um, considered uh, knowledge or what are considered um, areas of study that are um, worthy of taking up. And psychology, when it sort of veered hard towards the sciences, right, it's so social science, but it's sort of obsession with becoming a true science, uh, I think ended up causing some of the split. And again, this is very oversimplified, but I'm, I just want to sort of the over umbrella and then we can get into the specifics from where I see it in our field, psychoanalytically speaking, is that you had this separation between then philosophy and psychology and psychoanalysis and and then you end up having these silos where these ideas exist and other spaces where they don't right and as though like psychology didn't come from these ideas and we can see it if if any you know I wasn't a psychology major but I took psychology 101 and you have like pages upon pages upon pages about Pavlov and Skinner and all these people and you have literally maybe half a page on Freud and it's talking about id, id ego and super ego as that that's all he said right? And the disparagement in which it, psychoanalysis comes up. I, I think there's a pairing with United States higher education and also the pro- professionalization of the field and, and the monetization of psychology in general with insurance companies. I mean, that we can track that. I wish that were even talked about. Like, tell us the history of why we're here, but that's not even talked mm-hmm. about, right? Um, but within, I think, the, the paucity of these philosopher leftist thinkers and that's the key is that the people that you mentioned are fundamentally leftist thinkers and they had a very specific orientation to the world which included an anti-capitalist um critique and you know you only need to look you know a couple months ago i can't believe the election was only a couple months ago so it feels like it was decades ago and and you know, we're all traumatized from everything that came up. But, but the mere mention of leftism in the United States or socialism is like, you know, meltdown central. So we can see the forces, the larger forces structurally that might have um, been involved in some of that. And it's really important to see this is the complicity of institutions and fields right, with larger governmental practices. So when we look at sort of this is the government and this is their ideology, or this is United States ideology, but this is education, that's kind of a misnomer because we can see how the history of the field matches very much. I teach this in my ethics class about where where did the field go and what did it match up politically, what was happening sociopolitically. So that's number one, but I think the crux of this is psychology and particularly psychoanalysis really started to get away from leftist thinking very early on. I mean, but you could, there are, I, I don't know if, if people teach this, but the folks that we read that are like primary people in psychoanalysis, old school psychoanalysis, Fenichel, Ferenczi, they were Marxists. 
and they had like Marxist posse and they did like a zine and they were constantly talking to each other about these Marxist ideologies and they were leading the charge against the Nazification of psychoanalysis in like Hungary and in Germany. And where is this history? Wouldn't that be something we would be proud of that there were these awesome people in psychoanalysis that were fighting Nazis? Like that's the psychoanalyst I wanna be. I'm going to fight Nazis. I still want to fight Nazis, right? Um, We should all be, by the way. We should all be fighting Nazis. Um, But that's, I think that's start, that is very much a sort of historical, socio-historical process that rids itself of any political, any political leanings to the field. Our field is very political historically. And what we have seen is a slow sort of, um, disconnect from that to the point that now we can show up and and we're arguing about whether doing therapy is political or not like how do you take up the issue of a person's subjectivity and think that you're not being political in any way how do you take any position on issues related to race gender um ability anything and think that you are not being political and somehow we're here where we're like now we're debating whether or not these are issues and the number of times people have told me this is not psychoanalysis no this is psychoanalysis and w- there's been a cleaving of that from psychoanalysis for a very particular ideological end right the more conservative you become the more you're better able to shore up whiteness and white supremacy in a very specific way uh, and in many ways, Freud was a progenitor of that. I mean, he kicked out dissenters all the time, right? For different reasons, maybe, maybe narcissistic wounds and all that. But because um, even he had free clinics, everybody thinks about Freud as being, you know, super neutral. He wasn't. He fed his patients. He took them, right? He had uh, free clinics that he saw people with vouchers. So even the history is not as clean as we would want it to be. But Crushing dissent is a very specific history of psychoanalysis. It's it's and it's specific to anything that becomes a hegemonic process or a hegemonic institute or hegemonic thought. It starts to become very obsessed with maintaining itself, and then exploits power in that way toward the end of maintaining itself. What that means in the context of the United States is very codified in terms of what we might understand from a racial perspective, a gendered perspective. Back then, of course, it was also, you know, only psychiatrists could be psychoanalysts. We, again, we don't have to look very far to see some of this. And then, you know, you have present day where like, we are talking about race and psychoanalysis more. So many times we're now seeing the resurgence of Fanon. That phrase is so deeply aggravating to me because Fanon did not go anywhere. There isn't a resurgence. You're just finding him now, which again is very deeply indicative of a narcissistic view, a very US centric narcissistic view of the field, right? Fanon has been alive and well. The global South has been looking at Fanon for ages. Uh, Europe, some parts of Europe have been looking at Fanon for ages, just because the United States is now re- rediscovering him. doesn't mean there's a resurgence. And I think the same goes for Lacan. I, there, you have some pockets of Lacanian thought. Um, I was told when I came in and I asked why, why aren't we learning Lacan that he's too difficult to learn. Again, a, repli- a sort of representative of, of the way, the degradation, I think, of critical thinking in higher education in the United States. But that would be why I would want to learn him in graduate school if he's mm-hmm. difficult and have somebody mentor me about how do you read a text closely? How do you take up these issues? How do you critique? How do you Im- involve yourself in imminent critique? Um, so again, long-winded, but sort of multifaceted reasons why we're here. Mm-hmm. You really strike me as, um, and you can correct me if I'm reading you wrong, but you really strike me as a very global kind of person. Um, And I I say that because I myself am an immigrant, and I think I tend to think in very global ways about a lot of issues. And I notice a lot of times when I try to bring those issues up and look at a more collectivistic kind of um, approach to psychology, it's kind of shut down. I'm wondering if if you relate to that at all or if you have experienced that yourself, Um, because I I just hear a lot of what you're doing as like a very global kind of 
approach yeah. to psychology. Yeah, that's a great uh, observation. And no, you didn't read me wrong. Uh, so you're a very, you're an awesome clinician in training. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the very simple answer is yes, I am. And, and part of that is because how can we not be particularly in this globalized world, right? I, there, it, it would be irresponsible for us. It is irresponsible for us not to draw larger global connections. There are folks on the ground in multiple places doing phenomenal things. It's not that they're not doing them, it's that we're not paying attention to them. And when I say we, I use the global we in terms of unipolar power of the United States, but that's in service of empire right? Th that's what I mean about like all of these sometimes are like circular aspects that bring us back to the same thing of these larger structures and how we're implicated in them. When we practice from a non-global sense, we are more likely going to shore up these very specific ideological positions about the United States being the center of the world and everything else being a extension of the United States. That the United States is the place where all knowledge is produced. That the United States is, is the progenitor of all these things, whether psychologically or science or all of that. Not only is that absolutely incorrect in terms of what you see, the demographics who make up these issues, the importing of knowledge from other places but taking, uh, taking um, ownership over it, right? Who are the people who generate our knowledge, even if they're in the United States? Let's look at the numbers. Um, and, but also a sort of a starting of time in a very specific way. Like time did not start in the United States, but it, it sure, sure feels like that, especially when you're training in psychology, right? Um, so I think that that's, there's, that's what I mean about sort of a responsibility to a global orientation, because that is the world we live in. That is the reality principle, right? Is that it just because they're out of sight doesn't mean they're not happening. So when I do, when I am with colleagues in Palestine, th nothing that I'm importing is new to folks in Palestine. People might not read it or might not remember to cite them in their work, but they don't need anybody to come in and teach them, right? No, they don't need any saviors to come in and teach them how to do things. They are deeply imbricated in their communities and know what they're, and have been doing this at a long time in spite of global oppression, in spite of people sort of getting in, in their way in the most psychically damaging ways. Because people under occupation are are um, oppressed in ways that that many folks can't even imagine, and so all their their liberation work and their psychic work is in spite of that, right? Um, the same goes for folks in South Africa, my colleagues in South Africa who are doing incredible critical community psychology work, and. We sort of, you know, are in many ways catching up and in many ways not, but it's just so siloed off. The same thing goes for folks in the UK that I'm connected with. I mean, just all, and there's no way to be a responsible clinician if we're not oriented in that way. Um, just like being a responsible scholar means you know what's out there, you know, and if you don't, at least you don't have the arrogance to say, I know everything. <laughs> you say, there. Are, this is outside my scope. Perhaps there are people doing this. Um, the pushback that you're talking about is really important because I think that that's a pushback that, that presents itself as though it's a pushback of, oh, you're demanding so much or we can't possibly cover all of this or mm -hmm. yes, I know this exists, but right now we're focusing on all of these sort of things you probably have heard. Th that is in service of something larger. It's a particular ideological formation that through its enactment, right? And not an unconscious enactment, truly its enactment and its embodiment re-centers a certain type of narrative over another and presumes that this narrative is the starting point. And that's what we might call normativity in our field, even the way that we ask questions or the things that we teach our students to think about when they're in a room with somebody, uh, the way we orient them to what things you pay attention to and what things you don't, all of that is constructed somewhere, right? And all of that is in service of this very, uh, the myth of individuality uh, as well. And I think that's the biggest, mm -hmm. I think for me, the biggest tragedy of all of this is when I talk to my students, whether they're white or born and raised in the United States or elsewhere, is that individuality is a myth. 
that some folks chase more than others because they're socialized into this neoliberal idea of their own individuality and weakness if you rely on community. And others are perhaps more mm-hmm. used to yeah. communal spaces. But even that is a, a gross sort of stereotypical, right, uh, breakdown of things. But it's this alienation from communal spaces that is really at the heart of a lot of the struggle and the pushback. Because if people start to recognize, oh, I actually, all of this has actually been at the expense of communal spaces, at the expense of community, expense of um, collaboration, then we have a real technical issue with our whole field. Like our whole field is set around individuation, self-efficacy. And I think people get really scared consciously or unconsciously when you start bringing up those issues, they're having to question the entire edifice of their field and everything they've constructed their settler colonial narrative around right um it implicates everything how we do it how much we charge the fact that we charge the fact that there's no that there's no universal health care the fact that we train our students this way the fact that you aren't 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 remunerated for your labor that everything is implicated then um so what you see as just a natural organic question becomes like an an existential crisis for folks about their implication and people's suffering. It brings me back to something you had said a little bit earlier about just, well, psychology in general, I guess. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about where ego psychology has taken yeah. psychology, psychoanalysis yeah. in general in the U.S. Great and, and question. What do about it. So I think I... At the, at the risk of sounding repetitive in terms of like thematics, <clears throat> there is a lot that we can criticize and sort of um, look at ego psychology as having done. And at the same time, I think that gets all of psychoanalysis off the hook because it locates it in one space only. Like it's just ego psychology and that's something in the past. And if only we could just get out, get mm-hmm. the wretched ego psychologies uh, out of this, then we're cool. Um, and I think that that's misguided. That's a mis- It's sort of the United States placing all its racism in the South. It's like, no, the South is not the only place racism exists. When you have a settler colonial state, mm-hmm. everything is racist because you live on stolen land. <laughs> There's no way around it. But it's very convenient to find racism. Oh, it just lives in the South, right? Or it just lives in the Midwest or wherever you want it to live. It makes it much easier to take in. There's a parallel to that in psychoanalysis. Ego psychology came up with in a very specific time, right? And I don't think the majority of people are there anymore. What is fascinating is that in many ways, institutes still teach like that, mm-hmm. right? There's something to be said about let us learn our history and let's make a beeline out of, you know, where are the pitfalls of that. But it's rarely ever taught in such a critical way. It's usually used as a scapegoat to everything. And the bomb is always, but look where we're at now. We're not there anymore. And that's what I'm very weary about. Anytime we locate something as just Mm. living in the past, and if we can just excise that, then we'll be fine, is a red flag to me, right? Um, No, we can look at it as part of a historical trend. We can understand where it came from. We can understand the very, you know, awful parts of it and understand that things don't live just inside the person, that you are creating a dynamic with this patient and that you are just as responsible for the dynamics in the room as that person is. And you don't victim blame and you don't pathologize in the way that we might understand ego psychology to have done at that time. Right. Um, But all psychoanalysts do that at some point. It's not just ego psychologists. And my fear is that if we continue to use ego psychology as the sort of, um, I won't say scapegoat because it, there's, it's a deserving in many ways. But if we continue to use it as like the, the um, structure against which we compare everything else, we're missing. It's an out. It's such an easy out for what we continue to do right now. And psychoanalysis is what tells us if you have it in your history, it's likely to show back up. But somehow we forget, right, theoretically that it's going to show back up. So where are the fundamental sort of building blocks of our field right now? Why are we sort of thinking that whether it's relational psychoanalysis or intersubjectivity or any contemporary thoughts we have in psycho, 
are we foolish enough to think that they're not also imbricated in white supremacist structures and developmental theories that were made for a particular type of person, not a global uh, subject, that they also are very much mired in capitalist ideas of productivity, of what health and wellness looks like. All of our theories do that, right? And I think that that's a far, that's a, a much more fair position because it implicates the entire field. And the field was the one that created the conditions for ego psychology to come in and have such prominence, right? It's not that theory itself. There's people love now to be like, oh, ego psychology, but it's like, where were you back then? Where were you when analysts were sort of pushing conversion therapy, right? And still some of them, you know, this is my beef with Vulcan, by the way, he was one of the sort of leading figures of conversion therapy and still has his name on the website of that. Where are folks? You're still platforming him. You're still using his theories. You're still reading him in classes. Is it, is it live in ego psychology or does it live still in where we are right now and our responsibility to be accountable for all of history of psychoanalysis, including present day? On our listservs, when people are making fun of pronouns or being uh, irresponsibly racist, just and and people rallying to protect their colleagues, well, those people are oftentimes people who practice contemporary psychoanalysis, right? And I'm not calling for like a sort of um, vigilante uh, mentality. I'm saying I don't think we are in a position to critique where we once were if we're still there today. And we are, we're enacting harm every single day. So, I th and, and that to me is a larger, again, an ideological position of the theory itself. There's a reason why we continue to do this. And there's a lot of power that's involved in that and the power in naming someone else's psyche and the power. And there's a certain um, highness that people get off of that consciously or unconsciously. Laura, thank you so much for being with us today. I am really happy that you were able to meet with us. And Anybody who's interested in sort of um, creating mental health uh, cooperatives, um, you know, worker-owned practices, group practices, or doing pro bono work or doing activist community work, um, please write me. You can put my email in there. Write me, be in contact. This is all about community building. And when we find each other, we find each other. <laughs>This episode of the Unconventional Diet podcast is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, Anchor is completely free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. That's anchor.fm.